Water, where is it? A bitter disappointment. During a long, long, weary hour, there crossed my wildly delirious brain all sorts of reasons as to what could have aroused our quiet and faithful guide. The most absurd and ridiculous ideas passed through my head, each more impossible than the other. I believe I was either half or wholly mad. Suddenly, however, there arose, as it were from the depths of the earth, a voice of comfort. It was the sound of footsteps. Hans was returning. Presently the uncertain light began to shine upon the walls of the passage, and then it came in view far down the sloping tunnel. At length Hans himself appeared. He approached my uncle, placed his hand upon his shoulder, and gently awakened him. My uncle, as soon as he saw who it was, instantly arose. Well, exclaimed the professor. That ten, said the hunter. I did not know a single word of the Danish language, and yet by a sort of mysterious instinct I understood what the guide had said. Water, water. I cried in a wild and frantic tone, clapping my hands and gesticulating like a madman. Water, murmured my uncle in a voice of deep emotion and gratitude. Var? Where? Nedat? Below. Where? Below. I understood every word. I had caught the hunter by the hands, and I shook them heartily, while he looked on with perfect calmness. The preparations for our departure did not take long, and we were soon making a rapid descent into the tunnel. An hour later we had advanced a thousand yards, and descended two thousand feet. At this moment I heard an accustomed and well-known sound running along the floors of the granite rock a kind of dull and sullen roar, like that of a distant waterfall. During the first half hour of our advance, not finding the discovered spring, my feelings of intense suffering appeared to return. Once more I began to lose all hope. My uncle, however, observing how downhearted I was again becoming, took up the conversation. Hans was right, he exclaimed enthusiastically, that is the dull roaring of a torrent. A torrent, I cried, delighted at even hearing the welcome words. There's not the slightest doubt about it, he replied. A subterranean river is flowing beside us. I made no reply, but hastened on, once more animated by hope. I began not even to feel the deep fatigue which hitherto had overpowered me. The very sound of this glorious murmuring water already refreshed me. We could hear it increasing in volume every moment. The torrent, which for a long time could be heard flowing over our heads, now ran distinctly along the left wall, roaring, rushing, spluttering, and still falling. Several times I passed my hand across the rock hoping to find some trace of humidity of the slightest percolation. Alas! In vain! Again a half hour passed in the same weary toil. Again we advanced. It now became evident that the hunter, during his absence, had not been able to carry his researches any farther. 
Guided by an instinct peculiar to the dwellers in mountain regions and water finders, he smelt the living spring through the rock. Still he had not seen the precious liquid. He had neither quenched his own thirst, nor brought us one drop in his gourd. Moreover, we soon made the disastrous discovery that, if our progress continued, we should soon be moving away from the torrent, the sound of which gradually diminished. We turned back. Hans halted at the precise spot where the sound of the torrent appeared nearest. I could bear the suspense and suffering no longer, and seated myself against the wall, wall, behind which I could hear the water seething and effervescing not two feet away. But a solid wall of granite still separated us from it. Hans looked keenly at me, and, strange enough, for once I thought I saw a smile on his imperturbable face. He rose from a stone on which he had been seated, and took up the lamp. I could not help rising and following. He moved slowly along the firm and solid granite wall. I watched him with mingled curiosity and eagerness. Presently he halted and placed his ear against the dry stone, moving slowly along and listening with the most extreme care and attention. I understood at once that he was searching for the exact spot where the torrent's roar was most plainly heard. This point he soon found in the lateral wall on the left side, about three feet above the level of the tunnel floor. I was in a state of intense excitement. I scarcely dared believe what the eider duck hunter was about to do. It was, however, impossible in a moment more not to both understand and applaud, and even to smother him in my embraces, when I saw him raise the heavy crowbar and commence an attack upon the rock itself. Saved. I cried. Yes, cried my uncle, even more excited and delighted than myself, Hans is quite right. Oh, the worthy, excellent man. We should never have thought of such an idea. And nobody else, I think, would have done so. Such a process, simple as it seemed, would most certainly not have entered our heads. Nothing could be more dangerous than to begin to work with pickaxes in that particular part of the globe. Supposing while he was at work a breakup were to take place, and supposing the torrent once having gained an inch were to take an L, and come pouring bodily through the broken rock. Rock. Not one of these dangers was chimerical. They were only too real. But at that moment no fear of falling in of the roof, or even of inundation was capable of stopping us. Our thirst was so intense that to quench it we would have dug below the bed of old ocean itself. Hans went quietly to work a work which neither my uncle nor I would have undertaken at any price. Our impatience was so great that if we had once begun with pickaxe and crowbar, the rock would soon have split into a hundred fragments. The guide, on the contrary, calm, ready, moderate, wore away the hard rock by little steady blows of his instrument, making no attempt at a larger hole than about six inches. As I stood, I heard, or I thought I heard, the roar of the torrent momentarily increasing in loudness, and at times I almost felt the pleasant sensation of water upon my parched lips. 
At the end of what appeared an age, Hans had made a hole which enabled his crowbar to enter two feet into the solid rock. He had been at work exactly an hour. It appeared a dozen. I was getting wild with impatience. My uncle began to think of using more violent measures. I had the greatest difficulty in checking him. He had indeed just got hold of his crowbar when a loud and welcome hiss was heard. Then a stream, or rather jet, of water burst through the wall, and came out with such force as to hit the opposite side. Hans, the guide, who was half upset by the shock, was scarcely able to keep down a cry of pain and grief. I understood his meaning when, plunging my hands into the sparkling jet, I myself gave a wild and frantic cry. The water was scalding hot. Boiling, I cried, in bitter disappointment. Disappointment. Well, never mind, said my uncle, it will soon get cool. The tunnel began to be filled by clouds of vapor, while a small stream ran away into the interior of the earth. In a short time we had some sufficiently cool to drink. We swallowed it in huge mouthfuls. Oh. What exalted delight, what rich and incomparable luxury. What was this water, whence did it come? To us what was that? The simple fact was it was water, and, though still with a tingle of warmth about it, it brought back to the heart, that life which, but for it, must surely have faded away. I drank greedily, almost without tasting it. When, however, I had almost quenched my ravenous thirst, I made a discovery. Why, it is Chalabit water. A most excellent stomachic, replied my uncle, and highly mineralized. Here is a journey worth twenty to spa. It's very good, I replied. I should think so. Water found six miles underground. There is a peculiarly inky flavor about it, which is by no means disagreeable. Hans may congratulate himself on having made a rare discovery. What do you say, nephew, according to the usual custom of travelers, to name the stream after him? Good, said I. And the name of Hans Bach, Hans Brook, was at once agreed upon. Hans was not a bit more proud after hearing our determination than he was before. After having taken a very small modicum of the welcome refreshment, he had seated himself in a corner with his usual imperturbable gravity. Now, said I, it is not worth while letting this water run to waste. What is the use, replied my uncle, the source from which this river rises is inexhaustible. Never mind, I continued, let us fill our goatskin and gourds, and then try to stop the opening up. My advice, after some hesitation, was followed or attempted to be followed. Hans picked up all the broken pieces of granite he had knocked out, and using some toe he happened to have about him, him tried to shut up the fissure he had made in the wall. All he did was to scald his hands. The pressure was too great, and all our attempts were utter failures. It is evident, I remarked, 
that the upper surface of these springs is situated at a very great height above as we may fairly infer from the great pressure of the jet. That is by no means doubtful, replied my uncle, if this column of water is about 32,000 feet high, the atmospheric pressure must be something enormous. But a new idea has just struck me. And what is that? Why be it so much trouble to close this aperture? Because... I hesitated and stammered, having no real reason. When our water bottles are empty, we are not at all sure that we shall be able to fill them, observed my uncle. I think that is very probable. Well, then, let this water run. It will, of course, naturally follow in our track, and will serve to guide and refresh us. I think the idea a good one, I cried in reply, and with this rivulet as a companion, there is no further reason why we should not succeed in our marvelous project. Ah, my boy, said the professor, laughing, after all, you are coming round. More than that, I am now confident of ultimate success. One moment, nephew mine. Let us begin by taking some hours of repose. I had utterly forgotten that it was night. The chronometer, however, informed me of the fact. Soon we were sufficiently restored and refreshed, and had all fallen into a profound sleep.